Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we're taking a look at the Yugoslav M57 version of the Tokarev pistol. Now this isn't just a straight up copy of the Soviet Tokarev, like most of the other Eastern European Tokarev copies were, because like when they did AKs, Yugoslavia took a look at the Tokarev and thought, you know what, we can make this better than the Russians did it. I want to give a big thanks to Guns.com for sponsoring this video. At first glance they may look like just another online sales site, however they actually have a much more interesting uh, business model. They have a whole network of partner FFLs who are small brick and mortar shops who are able to advertise their individual inventory on Guns.com, thus giving them a nationwide reach for what they happen to have in the shop without having to build or advertise or promote their own independent websites. So for small FFL dealers it's a really cool uh, way to be able to bring a much larger audience to the guns that may have been sitting in your used rack for quite some time. So uh, I know there are a lot of FFLs who watch the channel. If you're not familiar with Guns.com I would highly recommend checking them out. I think you may find that they're a really interesting option for your shop. And of course if you're not an FFL they're definitely worth checking out because they have a wide variety of cool stuff that comes from all over the country. Very simple uh, shipping transactions, obviously everything done through FFLs, but uh, it's much more than just your typical drop shipped website. So check them out. In the immediate aftermath of World War II, Yugoslavia used primarily German small arms. Mausers, MG42s, Lugers, and P-38 pistols. Now that would transition over to more typically Eastern Bloc firearms after a pretty short period, and in fact Yugoslavia would purchase 1895 Nagant revolvers and TT-33 Tokarev pistols from the Soviet Union within just a few years of World War II ending, and those became their standard issue military sidearms. There was a plan initially to develop a domestic pistol as part of the 1948 five-year plan. Uh, that ended up getting pushed back into basically about ten years. It got pushed back to the late 1950s, and work actually began on this in 1957, hence the name M57, or the designation. Now it's important to point out here that Yugoslavia under Tito who, by the way, ruled the country until 1980, uh, was not just a Soviet puppet state, really quite the opposite. It was one of the least Soviet aligned of what's often thought of as the, the communist bloc or the Soviet bloc. Um, there were a lot more, well there were more personal freedoms in Yugoslavia than there were in a lot of the other Eastern Bloc countries, and Tito did a pretty adept job of balancing the West against the East and maintaining decent relations with both sides, um, and keeping his country out from under the thumb of Stalin and later Soviet Union leaders. So uh, his development of the Tokarev was actually done without a license from the Soviet Union, very much like Yugoslav AKs were not actually licensed produced, they were reverse engineered from other examples that Yugoslavia acquired. Uh, and with the Tokarev for example, the Yugoslav M57 actually won't use standard Tokarev pattern magazines, because one of the changes that Yugoslavia made was to make the grip and the magazine longer and give it a little bit larger capacity as well as, well, a longer and better grip. Anyway, why don't we take a closer look at this, because that's the most commonly recognized difference between the, the M57 and all the other Tokarevs, but there are a bunch of other changes as well that were made, and most of them are pretty smart changes. Let's go ahead and start on the outside of the pistol here with some markings. Up here on the slide we have 7.62 mm M57, that's of course for 7.62 by 25 mm Tokarev, a standard Tokarev cartridge. M57 is the military designation. These were all manufactured at Zastava, what is today Zastava, and there was an assortment of civilian versions of these pistols that were made as well. I'm going to leave those for a separate video because there's a whole bunch more to talk about uh, with those, and today we're just going to stick to this, which is the standard military pattern. We have a round star emblem on the grips here, which is actually very similar to what was on the Russian version, except instead of CCCP this is SFRJ, which is the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. It's worth pointing out that that uh, nomenclature was used on these guns from 1968 onward. Before that they were actually marked FNRJ, which is the Federal National something Republic of Yugoslavia. 
We also have a Yugoslav crest on the top of the slide. There was a similar change made on the crest in 1968, and that was to go from five little uh, torch flames there to six. Uh, in 1963 they added a sixth torch to the national emblem to represent Bosnian Muslims, although that change didn't make it into the pistol stamping until 1968. So this is a later production one, so this has six, and <laughs> even if I tell you that, like, these are really small detailed crests, and so it's kind of hard to tell at a glance anyway. Then on the right side of the gun we have the serial number on the frame and the slide. Uh, these have a, a letter prefix followed by a serial number. Total production uh, ran of the military pistols ran until 1982 and was about 270,000 guns. What they did here is they used a letter prefix to indicate the year of production, but they didn't restart the serial numbers. So uh, the first letter prefix was A in 1963, and actually I should say 63 and 64, so A and B were actually suffixes. The prefix starts with C in 1965 and continues from there out. Uh, K here is a 1973 manufacturer. And then, in interestingly, uh, they used N from 1975 through 1980. So you got like five years of N, uh, and then 1981 was O, 1982 was P, and that's the end of military production. So that's what the serial numbers indicate. Uh, for import purposes, they added a full serial number on the frame here as well, because this is part of, unfortunately, the importing requirement. And then some of the importers put marks up on the slide. This one was brought in by Century, and they put their import mark on the bottom of the trigger guard here, which is much nicer because it's a lot less obviously visible. I should also point out this Tokarev, like the, all the other standard Tokarev patterns, originally did not have any manual safety on it. Um, a lot of the earlier imports added a lever, a thumb lever safety here that it's decent as the added safeties go, it slips behind the grip here. Um, but I frankly, as a collector, I hate it when they do that kind of modification as part of import. I think it really destroys the historical uh, uh, reality of the pistols, frankly. What was cool about this recent batch of Century imports is that they realized uh, they had to add a safety, uh, some sort of safety mechanism to make them importable, but they didn't have to use a, a thumb safety, and instead they did realize that they could use a trigger safety, like a Glock or other striker-fired pistol. So uh, this required no permanent modification to the guns, and what I did after I got this pistol is I went and bought an original M57 safety. I think I got that one from uh, Apex Gun Parts, and it's a very simple drop-in, so I now have... I can take this and chuck it, and now I have the gun all in its original proper configuration. Okay, now on to our features comparison. The first and most obvious change is that Yugoslavia made the grip one round longer. It's about, the frame is about 16 millimeters longer, just a little over half an inch. It frankly gives you a better grip on the gun. A lot of people uh, have uh, their hand kind of slipping off the bottom of a standard Tokarev grip. This is, by the way, a World War II Russian gun, so it's a, a real good comparison for us. The Yugoslav M57 has a really good solid grip and a nine round magazine instead of eight. Now that does have implications for magazine uh, compatibility, because of course if I try to take a standard uh, eight round Tokarev magazine and put it into my M57, it'll go all the way in, but it doesn't lock in, and it won't lock the slide open because it doesn't actually come all the way up. It won't reach. It's too short. That said, I can take the oversized Yugoslav magazine, and it does lock into the standard Tokarev. The magazine catch location is exactly the same. Uh, it works perfectly fine here, and it does give you an extra round of capacity. While I have the magazines removed, this is a good opportunity to show you that the original Tokarev uh, does not have a magazine safety, but the M57 does. As long as I don't have a magazine in there, I can't actually drop the hammer. We'll take this apart in just a moment, and I'll show you how that works, and I mean, some people might want to remove it. I would say leave it intact. That's how the, the gun was actually designed. Looking at some of the other external features, uh, this sort of uh, large groove and small groove pattern is typical. That's the standard for Russian wartime and pre-war Tokarevs. 
after World War II, the Russians would change to just vertical small serrations, and most of the other Tokarev copies that were made after the war share that pattern. Yugoslavia did that, but they also angled those, uh, those grooves slightly forward, presumably to give a little bit better grip uh, on the slide. Not a major change, but it is a distinction. There is a more substantial difference in the front sights. So on the M57, the front sight is actually dovetailed in place, so it can be adjusted for windage, and the front of the slide is actually serrated here to prevent glare. On the Russian guns, you got nothing here, you just got a, a plain fixed little front sight blade. So a definite improvement on the M57. And the other ergonomic upgrade from Yugoslavia here is the magazine release. On the original Russian Tokarevs, it's a pretty small button, it's smooth and rounded. Uh, on the Yugoslav guns they made it bigger, they made it concave, and they gave it some texturing. So it's a little uh, easier to hit, it's got a little grippiness to it, your finger's not going to slip off of it as easily. This is an interesting one in that it seems like an improvement, but at the same time one of the uh, long-term Russian complaints with the Tokarev was that the magazine's uh, re release was too easily engaged and it could be bumped. And I am curious if Yugoslavia had any similar issues, or perhaps if, I don't know, if, if their handling or doctrine with the pistols was different in some way that prevented this from being an issue for them. Now the rest of the differences we're going to take a look at are internal, so we need to go ahead and disassemble the pistol, which requires pulling this uh, like elongated E-clip off the back. That's easily tapped back, and then I can pull out the slide stop pin, and the slide's going to come right off the top of the gun. Uh, we do have a removable fire control unit, just like the standard Tokarev. The grips are also removed just like a standard Tokarev, which means there's a little lever right in there. I'm going to go in there with a screwdriver, and pivot that. We'll see how this works in just a moment. So that is how the grips are locked on. This is also just like a standard Tokarev. This is the locked position, and when you pull this lever back, uh, it unlock the, these two tabs are no longer locked inside the frame, and the grip panel just comes off, so there's no need for a screw. We have the same mechanism here. This one's a little tight, so I'm just going to use a brass punch on it. There we go. Pivot that down, and then the other grip panel comes off. And now we can see the magazine safety right there. So it is a little lever that uh, it flexes in from the side, and when I put a magazine in you can see it gets lifted up. So that's the safety's engaged. At this point the magazine's in, the safety's disengaged, and the way it is working is, I can actually show you this on my old trigger, this little notch uh, interfaces with that tab. So when that tab's in, it locks into this notch and it just doesn't let you pull the trigger. When that tab is held up, the trigger can move back. And if I compare that with my standard Russian Tokarev here, you can see there is no notch in the trigger bar and there's no safety uh, up in the frame. In order to take out the trigger, all you have to do is reach back here to the trigger spring, push it in, and you can pivot this. There we go, downward and the trigger just comes out through the bottom of the frame like that. And then reinstallation is as easy as sliding it back up in, and then just snap it up in place. There you go. Next up, when we take off the slides, uh, when you take apart a typical Tokarev you will generally oh, get that, because it has a big long spring and a non-captive guide rod, and that is perhaps other than the magazine capacity, that's perhaps the best improvement that the Yugoslavs made to the Tokarev, because what they did was give this, if I can slide it out here, a captive recoil spring assembly. This is awesome, it makes disassembly and reassembly really quite a lot easier. If we look at the side of the slides here, uh, you'll notice on the Russian Tokarev there is a pin, or a screw, uh, there's a cross pin right here in the slide, and it does not exist on the Yugoslav gun. This is the firing pin retaining pin. So um, on the standard Tokarev, there's the other end of it, 
uh, the firing pin has this half circle cutout in it, and this pin goes through and that prevents the firing pin from coming out or from going too far forward. And there you can see the very back of the slide where the firing pin goes in, where it gets hit by the hammer. The problem with that design is that it made the firing pin inherently fragile because it had this big section cut out of it. The Yugoslavs wanted to keep the firing pin stronger and fully cylindrical, so what they did was create a different style, sort of a 1911 style of firing pin retainer at the back here. So there's no cross pin. Uh, the downside to this is this is really kind of a pain to get in and out. It does make disassembly more difficult, unlike the captive recoil spring, but it also makes the firing pin a lot stronger and uh, much less prone to breakage, which was one of the problems on the original Tokarev. So that's sort of a, a compromise. There's some pros and some cons, um, and I'm going to leave that one in there because it really is a pain in the butt to, to take out. Beyond that, we really have... Uh, those are all the major changes, so I can pull the barrel out here. You'll notice the Tokarev has locking lugs that fully encircle the barrel. That was one of the... that was the primary improvement from the TT-30 to the TT-33 Tokarev. It makes the barrel stronger, and it's actually uh, cheaper and faster to make than having lugs that are just at the top, like the original 1911. Um, we have our detachable unitized fire control group here. Uh, one of the cool things with that is that it actually reinforces the magazine feed lips uh, and does a lot to help with feeding. Uh, one of the, the nice designs of the classic Tokarev, and that's something that Yugoslavia just copied and kept intact wisely. So there you go, there is the Yugoslav M57 Tokarev fully field stripped. Total production of these, as I said, was about 270,000, and that's the military pattern. We'll get into the civilian patterns in separate videos. Uh, the first prototypes were made in 1960, serial production begins in 1963, military production ends in 1982, and this would be the standard military sidearm for the Yugoslav People's Army, as well as the standard sidearm for Yugoslav police forces until 1988. So 63 until 88 when it was replaced by the Zastava Z88, which is also subject for a separate video later on. Um, one of the common questions that comes up with this is how was it carried, being that it has no manual safety? And the answer is there are two different ways that this could be legitimately carried in a reasonably safe manner. Uh, one of them is to simply carry it with the chamber empty. This is something that people cringe at today, but historically was a very real option. Um, the level of military handgun training typically means that a lot of military and police folks who carry handguns are not particularly well trained or skilled with them. This is why we have magazine safeties primarily, uh, magazine disconnect safeties, is because of the propensity for police and military personnel to accidentally shoot themselves while clearing a handgun, because they take the magazine out, assume it's empty, don't realize it still has a round in the chamber, and kablamo. And well, if you have a magazine safety, it's not as good as that not happening in the first place. But it, it, I mean, it's not as good as education, but it does prevent the actual firing problem from happening. So that's the one, one method is just carry it with chamber empty. When you draw it, given that it's in a flap holster anyway, it's not like you're speed drawing the thing. You draw it, and then rack it, and then you can start shooting. The other way would be to insert a magazine, rack around into the chamber, and then very carefully drop the hammer down to the half-cock notch, which on the Tokarev is a fairly safe position. It does deliberately lock the hammer and lock the slide when it's in half-cock. So you could carry it that way with full capacity, but at that point you still have to thumb the hammer the rest of the way back before you can start shooting. That's probably a little faster than racking the slide, but not a lot faster. So those are the two options. Now, if you would like to know more about the Tokarevs, I highly recommend Cameron White's book, The Complete Book of Tokarev Pistols, which has a bunch of good information about the M57s, including a complete year-by-year -year production and serial number breakdown, which is cool, and also details on accessories, things like the cleaning, uh, cleaning rods, the holsters, that sort of stuff that was used. Now, there is another book out there that talks about these Tokarevs, and that is Communist Block Handguns by George Lehman. Do not use this as your reference for the M57, because there's a bunch of incorrect information in it, in it about the Yugoslav Tokarev. So, Complete Book of Tokarev Pistols is your go-to reference if you're looking for more info.
If you're looking to get one of these yourself, of course because of the recent imports they're pretty widely and easily available, at least at the time of this filming. But hey, maybe check out guns.com first, they're a cool site. They have a bunch of this sort of thing there, and uh, hey, if you're an FFL and you've got one or two of these and they just aren't moving in your local shop, maybe consider listing them through guns.com and give them a broader audience. Anyway, hopefully you guys enjoyed the video, thanks for watching.